with coverage you can count on. This is Channel 3 Eyewitness News at 6 in HD. A jury deliberated for more than six hours, but there is still no verdict for a former Red Bank police officer accused of beating a man at a traffic stop in 2014. Thanks for joining us. I'm Cindy Sexton. And I'm David Carroll. Mark Kaler was charged with assault after video shows him beating a man who says he resisted, who he says resisted arrest. And that altercation was caught on camera. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Kelly McCarthy has been following the story and is live now. Kelly, tell us what happened today. David, it's pretty clear this is not an easy decision for the jury to make. They deliberated for about six and a half hours today, and after that amount of time, they actually went back into the courtroom and told the judge they, quote, are unable to reach a unanimous verdict. Now, the judge's response to that was to send them home for the day and tell them to come back tomorrow morning and to continue to deliberate. Earlier today, the jury heard closing arguments in the case against former Red Bank police officer Mark Kaler, and they now have to decide if Kaler committed aggravated assault and official misconduct during that 2014 traffic stop. Now, the main part of this trial has focused on that dash cam video. It shows Kaler punching the victim seven times. But now it's up to the jury to decide if his actions were justified or if Kaler took things too far. There's one strike. There's two. If this is done because he's resisting, why don't you stop and see if it worked? Three. Four. If this is done because he's trying to protect himself from being bit, why don't you stop after you've broken his eye? Uh, with all due respect to the prosecution, that is nonsense. That is absolute nonsense. You don't stop and reflect with this man struggling underneath you. Appreciation of uh, your services and all that. And again today, the victim in this case was not present in the courtroom. The jury will come back tomorrow morning and continue deliberations to see if they can reach a verdict in this case. I will be continuing to watch for a verdict here in court, and I'll have updates online and on social media as soon as I get them. I'm Kelly McCarthy, live at the Hamilton County Courthouse, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thank you, Kelly. A Ringgold woman is behind bars facing vehicular homicide and drug charges after police say she struck and killed a pedestrian. This happened on October 29th. The Georgia State Patrol officers say 27-year-old Michael Neese was walking along the shoulder of the interstate. The car, driven by 22-year-old Jordan Shelton, ran off the roadway, hit Neese, and then a guardrail. Neese died at the scene. Shelton and her passenger, 24-year-old Nicholas Spurgeon, were taken to the hospital, treated, and released. Shelton's bond is set at $8,400. A grand jury indicted a Chattanooga man for first degree murder today. Police say 52 year old Mark Howard strangled Jeanette Scolton to death. 34 year old Scolton was living at the Chat Inn on East 23rd Street. The medical examiner said she was likely dead before her body was found in late March. Police say Howard is serving another sentence at Silverdale Correctional Facility. Officers used text messages and security video to charge Howard. He's set to appear in court on these new charges in May of next year. Here in the Tennessee Valley, crews continue to monitor the outbreak of brush fires and wildfires. The Georgia Forestry Division and Tennessee Forestry Division have been fighting these fires for about a month. But Storm Alert meteorologist Nick Austin tells us there may be more trouble coming for firefighters tomorrow. He joins us live right now. Nick, fill us in. That's right, Cindy and David. Besides increasing winds tomorrow, late tonight and tomorrow, as well as a change in wind direction, the ground is still very dry. Exceptional drought conditions still continue across many parts of the Tennessee Valley and also here in North Georgia. And as you mentioned, for more than a month now, the Georgia Forestry Commission has been trying to get three major wildfires under control. Uh, these are in Day County, the Cahutta Wilderness, and also on Rocky Face. Another fire started just earlier today in Murray County off High Tower Loop. And now the uh, Forestry Commission says that they have reached that fire and uh, they're putting a line around it. So they're in the process of trying to get that contained. It's about 30 acres or so. The shifting and stronger winds will make it more difficult to fight these fires. They can reignite and spread fairly easily, but uh, crews never know how far these fires might spread. Uh, Ranger Pat Stockett says they are ready to meet the challenge. 
We do things like pack sleeping bags in our trucks. Um, we prepare to be out all night. We prepare to, you know, we, we augment our staff that, you know, we'll rotate crews every 12 hours. Now they'll also check and recheck the vehicles and the equipment before they uh, head up to these fires uh, just to make sure they're extra prepared. Stockett also says uh, that it's so dry that a piece of wood just the size of a pencil can burn at the same rate as a small log. So this drought situation is just not helping. And uh, folks just need to be careful. The Georgia Forestry Commission just urges everyone to obey the burn bans and the campfire bans across North Georgia. Live in Walker County, Nick Austin, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Nick, thank you. Currently 17 brush fires are burning around the Channel 3 viewing area right now. We told you yesterday 125 fires are burning across Georgia. Four are in the Tennessee Valley. 28 fires are burning across Tennessee. 13 are in our area. The falling leaves are landing on the embers in some cases starting up little fires again within the containment areas. Crews have to go by and check each one daily. We'll keep you up to date on these fires at WRCBTV.com. A parent is concerned about Cleveland Middle School's bathroom policy after her daughter experienced an embarrassing incident. The mom says when her daughter asked to go to the bathroom, she was told no. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Tanisha Cordell explains the policy. Well, Cindy, school administrators tell me students are allowed to use the restroom before and after every class, totaling about nine possible bathroom breaks throughout the day. Uh, but the mother says uh, she was not aware of the policy until after an embarrassing incident occurred with her daughter last month. You know, she's a female and she needed to go to the bathroom to take care of her, um, her monthly, and she wasn't allowed to do that. Katherine Sandra says she was concerned and upset when her 12 year old daughter came home from school in tears last month. She says when her daughter asked to go to the restroom, she was told to wait 40 minutes until class ended. She told me that she was just shaking her leg and shaking her leg and she tried, you know, her best to hold it, but she just couldn't hold it anymore. I just think that's embarrassing um, for her to have to go through that, you know, to walk through school, let it air dry, you know, until she finished up with her last class. I mean, that, that's just a lot to do. Cleveland school administrators say the policy is in place because of safety reasons. If there's an emergency, students can tell them and get permission to go to the restroom. But Sandra says her daughter didn't feel comfortable speaking up about her situation. After meeting with several school officials, Sandra says she just wants her daughter to feel safe and cared for at school. I want to be able to trust and know that my children are in good hands. When they leave me and they come to school, the teachers are like second parents to children because they spend a lot of time with my children in school. And I want to be able to know that you're making the right decision. The supervisor of secondary education says there are no plans to change the policy, but the mother also tells me she did get a doctor's note for her daughter to take to school and show her teachers from now on. In the studio, Tanisha Cordell, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Thanks, Tanisha. Residents in Hamilton County are lining up to vote early, which won't last much longer, and that is causing a traffic jam on Amnicola Highway. If you want to be a part of that, you have about 50 minutes or so before the polling locations close. Channel 3 Eyewitness News reporter Sarah Sidery says you better get there in a hurry. We've sent Sarah out to the scene and she joins us live now. How's it going, Sarah? Well, David, we're out here at the Hamilton County Election Commission and the line is wrapped around the building right now. Uh, you can see the line just continuing to grow as more cars uh, are driving in for the last day of early voting in Tennessee. Uh, there's also no more room in the parking lot, so people are having to park out in the grass out here too. Uh, there's a little bit of a wait when you drive in just um, to find a good parking space. And uh, now we're told that it's about 30 minutes, uh, a 30 minute wait right now to vote. The line is moving relatively quickly for how long it is. Everybody in line by seven o'clock, which is when the polls close, will be able to vote. But anybody who shows up after that that time is going to have to wait until Tuesday. For now, reporting live, Sarah Sidery, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. So some of you may have waited too late to vote early. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. But there is next Tuesday. And the yes. lines could be long again then, too. Yeah. Coming up next at 6, a Medal of Honor winner who saved dozens of lives in World War II without ever picking up a weapon will be featured on the big screen tonight. He just was a, a, a gentle soul that um, 
just didn't want himself to be glorified. He wanted all that to go to, to God. We're talking about Desmond Doss, a local hero, national hero as well. The decision to make the film was made right here in our area, outside a local supermarket. You'll hear from the producer of the movie who made it all happen next. Well, this week, a highly anticipated war movie opens in theaters everywhere, and our area has a strong tie to the story of Desmond Doss, the conscientious objector who wanted to serve in World War II. He lived most of his life here in our area after the war. We at Channel 3 were honored to share his remarkable story in our Veterans History Project in 2004, just two years before his death. He was scorned by his band of brothers in the 77th Infantry, but ended up saving the lives of at least 75 of them on a cliff in Japan in 1945. Hacksaw Ridge is his story. I can't stay here while all of them go fight for me. Don't you figure this war is just going to fit in with your ideas? While everybody else is taking life, I'm going to be saving it. And that's going to be my way to serve. This movie was years in the making. One reason, it took a man Desmond Doss trusted to convince him to tell the story. Producer Terry Benedict had read about Doss as a child and even met the war hero at church summer camp. The men reconnected at a Medal of Honor reunion nearly 20 years ago. We started talking about uh, making a documentary and, and of course a movie. He was very concerned about how that would be handled. He had always said no to Hollywood for decades, since 1945 when he got the medal. The two men shared a common faith, both Seventh-day Adventists, and Benedict came here to see Doss. I just really wanted to impress upon him that his story, journey of faith, serving others, could be a great inspiration and a great message to all of us. And this familiar store in Collegedale became the backdrop for the turning point of telling the story of Desmond Doss. 
He said yes. He said yes out in front of the grocery store at um, the Village Market. The story began in 1942, just months after Pearl Harbor, when Dawson listed as a medic, but said his faith would not allow him to carry a weapon. I had no weapons. I had a choice of any weapon I would accept, even the French night. I said, I'll leave the fighting to y'all, and I'll just do the patching. Doss's mountain training exercises included learning to tie knots. While practicing a bowlin, he discovered he could make two loops instead of one if he doubled the rope. On an Okinawa mountaintop in the spring of 1945, he would use his discovery in heroic fashion. Japanese soldiers shot and injured dozens of his fellow troops along a cliff. With enemy fire raining down, Doss, unarmed, climbed to the top to rescue them. None of us had any assurance of a return. I knew what was up there because I saw the dead up there. What happened, the Lord brought to my mind that double bowl I not. Why I could put it a loop, leg through each loop around the way, and I could lure these men off one at a time. And how I was going to get all those men, I didn't know. But I just kept praying, Lord, please help me get one more. One more until, believe it or not, I got every man off. I got the last man off and then I came down. Now, my clothes were bloody. I'd been soaked to the skin by the blood of my men. He saved at least 75 men that day, one at a time, lowering each to safety. Desmond Doss became the first conscientious objector to receive the Medal of Honor. And years later, the singular most important message Doss wanted to convey in a movie was his faith in God. One of the things that did happen out in front of that grocery store was I, I knew he was really concerned. And, you know, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian. And, and I said to him, look, I'll, I'll answer to God first, you second, and everybody else can get in line. And he got a big grin on his face and said, okay, all right, let's do it. And that was the start of our journey. How about that? And a couple of notes about that movie. His son, Desmond Doss Jr., now lives in Washington State. And uh, they asked him, did, did they get it right? And he said, the actor who plays Doss, Andrew Garfield, got it right. Yeah, he said spot on mm -hmm. about that. It's open uh, right now in movie theaters. You can start seeing it tonight. I'm looking forward to it. And it's about war, so it's very graphic. Just know that ahead of time, very realistic. We'll be right back.
All right, this drought monitor is not good. The exceptional drought, which is the worst drought you could possibly be in, is expanding all across our viewing area. If you're not under an exceptional drought, you're under an extreme drought, which is almost as bad. It's very, very nasty. And it looks like it's going to get worse uh, coming up over the next few weeks or so. So let's take a look at the radar. Just a few sprinkles moving past Nashville, and they're fading. These showers have moved towards Crossville and maybe just clipping some of our northern counties, but there's just not that much rain out there. We pull back a little bit on the radar here, and you can see that most of the rain is up into West Virginia, moving into Virginia and out of Kentucky. So we missed out. Again, westerly winds at 6, 80 in the city, 79 in Cleveland, 81 Dalton Murphy at 73. We broke a record though, 83 the high, and the old record 82 set back in 1974 and 57 was the overnight low. 83 Dalton, 83 Trenton, 83 in Calhoun, Chatsworth, Lafayette and Scottsboro at 82, 81 in Cleveland and Ottawa while it was 80 in Lakeside, 81 in Dunlap and 83 in Ringgold for today, 83 in Dayton and Pikeville. Well, I was 74 in Colmont, 78 Kegel Mountain, to 81 all the way up to Etowa, Athens 83, 72 Turtletown and Murphy at 77. Latest Vipercast is showing just a sprinkle, maybe, and uh, that's out of here really quick, and that would be north of the city. Now on a Friday afternoon, looks like a beautiful night for Friday, uh, Friday night football, high pressure building in, no big changes into the weekend, more sunshine, just pleasant, very pleasant weather. And if it wasn't for the drought, it'd be wonderful. And then coming up into Sunday, more of the same dry weather continues. This is Sunday afternoon around five. We get into Monday morning. Again, no rain around here. All the rain is on the other side of the Mississippi. Pinpoint forecast says tomorrow, Signal Mountain 71. Mostly sunny skies after just a few morning clouds. Look out mountain, you'll be about 72, so a lot cooler. 57 tonight with that sprinkle north of the city possible, but that's it, just a couple hundreds. At the very most, most of us won't see anything. Tomorrow, 76, but the winds will pick up out of the north at 15 to 20, and that'll be a problem for the firefighters. And then tomorrow night, 46 with clear skies. And the seven-day forecast, beautiful on Saturday, beautiful on Sunday. 40s and 70s for the highs and the lows. And that should pretty much continue right into the rest of the week with a few more clouds rolling in, too. Uh, all right. Okay. And Paul Shaheen is right around the corner with sports.
John Starr never hid from a coaching challenge. In fact, he's made a career thriving in those very situations. Taking over Howard might have been his toughest challenge yet, but here we are less than a year into the job. The Hustle and Tigers are playoff bound and being featured in our Friday Night Football Game of the Week. For more on the upstart Tigers, Jill Jelnick has us covered. It's only been six years since Howard's last postseason appearance, but to some, it feels like decades. In my ninth grade year, we didn't do too good. 10th grade, we didn't do, do too good. And we're always stuck together like this same ninth grade team. And then now we're seniors that we know how to play together. We've been playing for four years, and it's just like an awesome feeling. Having won three games the last three years, Jawan Gamble and the Hustlin' Tigers needed a change. And first-year head coach John Starr provided just that. The biggest thing that I think these kids just had to start believing in themselves. You know, when I got here, they had to work ethic. They had the same athleticism that they've always had. And, uh, you know, they just had to start working and believing what, in what they were doing. Starting running back Mackenzie Williams almost didn't play his senior year, but after being encouraged by the coaching staff, he realized he had the chance to be a part of something bigger than his final season. When I look back, the only thing I can do is be so proud and be so grateful for what I helped start and hope that the players after me and the students after me keep it going. Until Howard comes back into the Chattanooga playoff picture, the high school playoff picture as one of the dominant teams. That's what I'm hoping for, and it starts with Friday. It sure does, and we will be there for it. And tonight at 11, we'll hear from the other half of our game of the week, that being unbeaten at top-seeded Sequatchie County High School. In the college ranks now, the FCS is doing something new this season. They're doing four FCS playoff committee rankings leading up to the actual start of the playoffs. The first rankings were released today. The on they only do the top 10, though. That's all right. The Chattanooga Mox. Number eight, which means if the season ended today, the mocks would get a first round by other rankings of note. Number one, Jacksonville State, five time defending champions, North Dakota State ranked fourth. The Citadel out of the Southern Conference who beat Chattanooga ranked sixth. Also a tip of the hat to Baylor school grad and Tennessee linebacker Colton Jumper. Jumper is one of 52 Bullsworth Trophy candidates. Now the Bullsworth Trophy recognizes the most outstanding FBS player that began its career as a walk-on. On the diamond, very early this morning, the streak of all bad streaks ended for the first time in 108 years. Yes, the Chicago Cubs are celebrating a World Series championship. They beat Cleveland in 10 innings, 8-7. to seven. I said they were celebrating early this morning. They have not started, stopped rather, celebrating yet. No, they're still jumping. And rightfully so. <laughs> Can't blame them. And, you know, if you have friends in Chicago, and I'm looking for some of mine, they're, they're selling out of the, the caps and jerseys, so the, all the championship things, no just surprise. as soon as they make them. So if you know anybody there, put in a good word for me. I'd like to have one. You see what Rizzo did with the ball after he caught it first base? What's that? Put it right in his pocket. <laughs> Smart right. move. Yeah. For history. Cooperstown's calling him. Yeah. That's right. All right. Uh, let's take a look at uh, the radar now. I want to show you a few sprinkles that are falling just over the extreme northern part of Ray County, just north of Spring City. May not even be hitting the ground. Don't expect any rain tonight. Okay. We'll see you at 11.